Aloha, New Hope Leeward, and welcome to Leeward Online. My name is Justin, for those of you who don't know me, and I am super excited that you're here joining us this weekend. We're in week four of our Seeds series, and we have our senior pastor, Josiah Nordgren, bringing the word this weekend. We're going to kick things off with some worship. So if you're ready to worship, give us a little chi in the chat, turn up your volume, and let's praise God together. Your glory. 
glory goes beyond all faith.
God, when we sing that the cry of our heart is to bring you praise, we don't just sing those lyrics because they're the words of the song, God, but we sing that because that is the cry of our hearts. All we want to do, God, is to bring you praise, for you are worthy of all the praise forever and ever and ever. God, will you consume us from the inside out? God, will you invade every nook and cranny of our bodies, God, and just fill us and make us new in a way that only you can? God, we love you with all of our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. I am so stoked that you've joined us this weekend, church family. It's 4th of July weekend, and my prayer for our nation is that we would know what it is to be truly unified. I pray that we would love our neighbors, seek to understand each other's stories, have true compassion for one another, and learn what it means to be of one heart and one spirit. I'm thankful that I live in a place where we are free to worship God, whether it is in a church building or in the comfort of our own homes. So we're gonna pause right now and take a moment to pray for our tithes and our offerings. And I know the season is getting tougher and tougher for many of us. And sometimes it's so hard to feel safe and secure when things are uncertain. But what I want to encourage you to continue to do is to trust the Lord and know that he's taking care of you. What we have on this earth is not our own. And when we take what we've been given and steward it for the purposes of Christ's kingdom, then God is glorified. So when we can learn to let go of our need to control and feel secure, we can start to experience the freedom that God has for us. So whether you're giving online, through our app, or even by mail, I just want to encourage you to keep being obedient and trust the Lord, knowing that he is going to provide you with all that you need. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are our great provider and that we can trust you. That no matter what's going on in our world, no matter what our bank account looks like, we know that we can trust you with everything that we have. God, we know that what you have given to us is not our own, but we are stewarding it forward for the purposes of your kingdom. So God, would you take these tithes and these offerings, would you use it for the expansion of your kingdom and your glory? And would we see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven? God, we love you and we praise you. We pray everything in your name. Amen. All right, like I mentioned earlier, we are in week four of our Seed series, and Pastor Josiah has an amazing message for us. So get your Bibles and your notes ready. You can access all of that via our app, and let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Aloha, New Hope Leeward family tuning in here in Hawaii, the mainland, and around the world. Welcome to Leeward Online. My name is Josiah Norgren. I'm the senior pastor here at the church. Today, we're continuing on in our series entitled Seeds, where we're talking about how you and I grow forward from here, wherever here is for you right now. We've talked about growing through community, growing through God's word, through scripture. And today, we're going to talk about repentance. Now, before we get into it today, I want to start off with this universal truth that we rarely talk about when it comes to our faith. Growth happens through failure. Growth happens through failure. We know that this is true when it comes to business, when it comes to a craft, or even a hobby. Like, let me give you an example. 
when I was about 12 years old, I, I played soccer up until that time. And it, I hit this point where I got tired of just running laps. I got, got tired of the coach telling me what to do. And so I quit and I picked up uh, one of these. And this is that long ago, man. And I, I, I was changed from that moment. This is all I thought about during that time. Now, here is the thing about skateboarding. In order to get better at this, you have to fall a lot. Like there is absolutely no way around failure. And I was thinking about when I was learning and actually in the beginning, even though I was jumping over tiny little things, alling over little things like this, that's when my worst falls happen. I've fallen directly on my face. I've had the board pop up and hit me in the face, sprained ankles. I've had it impale me between my legs. I mean, everything that this board could do to me, it did in those first couple months. And that was all in the beginning. Now I still fall, I've gotten a lot better since then. And there are some of you that are watching this and you don't think that I still got it, okay? So first of all, uh, come at me. Actually, you know what, better yet, come with me. In order to prove to you that I still got it, I wanted to ollie or jump over something and I don't wanna risk ruining important church property. So today I brought uh, Pastor Justin Masuda who's gonna let me uh, jump over him. Now it's been a while, uh, quarantine hasn't done well for me and uh, gravity is against me, but Justin, you feeling good? Okay, cool, it's been a while, so let me just get my sea legs back. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe I got to ollie over Pastor Justin for a sermon. <laughs> I love my church. I love my job. Uh, actually, before we move on, uh, this is important. I just want to, sh I want to see that picture of Pastor Justin again. So let's put that up. <laughs> That's a true friend right there. There's uh, Justin giving his award-winning uh, smile. Okay, so I have a point here. I promise this illustration was not to just live out some dream of mine of skateboarding in the foyer, although that's true too. Uh, in order to get better, I had to fail. And I never learned to stop failing or falling. I actually had to learn to get better at it. I had to learn how to fall. There's a science to falling in skateboarding. I'm gonna say that again. I never learned to stop falling. I just learned to get better at it. This is, has been true for skateboarding and it's actually been true for my faith. Now stay with me. I'm not giving you license to sin or fall or fail. I'm saying you're gonna do it anyway, no matter what. Every single day you are gonna sin, you are gonna miss the mark. And so I'm convinced, especially if you're newer in your faith because your worst falls often come in the beginning. I'm convinced you will never grow in your faith unless you learn how to fall, unless you learn what to do after you sin. Because if you will allow him to, God will actually grow you through your failure. The greats of the Bible failed and God not only continued to use them, but he actually grew them through it. Here's some examples. Jo Jonah ran from God. Jacob lied. David committed adultery and murder. And you know what? We never really talk about this. David was actually kind of a bad father too. When you look at him in the later years, Elijah was depressed. He walked into the wilderness ready to die. Peter denied Jesus three times. The disciples all deserted Jesus when he needed them most. And even if you feel like, oh, you know what, pastor, but you don't know the things that I've done. Paul has got you beat. Paul killed Christians when his name was Saul. I don't know where you're at right now, the sin that you've done, what or where you've been hiding, but God knows. And would you please hear this, pay attention. You are not disqualified from the call of God. If you are still breathing, it is not over. You failed, you've sinned, but a measure of a Christian is not whether or not they sin. A measure of a Christian is what they do after they sin. And so I'm convinced, convinced, the only way to grow in your faith is to know how 
to fall, to know how to fail, to know what you do after. And so today we're going to talk about repentance. Now the word repent does not conjure up beautiful images for you and I. When I think of the word repent, I think of an angry guy on a corner with a cardboard sign, right? That says repent. Although it's a word we would love to dodge, we can't. It's often described as the first word of the gospel. You have John the Baptist, you have Jesus, and you have Peter all using this word at the beginning of their ministry. Look at Matthew 3, 1 through 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Go ahead one chapter. From that time, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Acts 2, when the early church was just starting out, Peter, repent and be baptized. First word of the gospel. And in the Greek, this word for repent is matanaeo, and it actually means to change one's mind. Now, if you look at repent in the Old Testament, it always means to change one's direction. And actually, you need both when it comes to repentance. See, repentance is changing both your mind and direction. Let's talk about direction first. So if I'm indulging in my sin, so say it's the same sin, habitual sin, I'm doing it over and over and over. To repent is to actually do an about face and to turn my back. To turn my back on the things that break God's heart and to turn toward God himself. But changing direction isn't just enough. In our devotions this week, we started the book of Isaiah. And in the beginning of the book, God is just over it. Like he is over his people and they've turned back to him, but they haven't changed their minds. So I'm just going to paraphrase what God says in these verses. This is kind of Isaiah, 11, or Isaiah 1, 11 through 14. God basically says, why all these sacrifices at the temple? Why all these empty religious practices? I find no pleasure in it. Why are you all flooding into the temple right now? Stop with your offerings, your incense, your celebrations. He says, I can't bear your worthless assemblies. I hate them. They are a burden to me. And the God of the universe in these verses says, I am weary. I'm tired of it. The people had changed their direction but they had not changed their minds. So when they were done doing church and sacrifices and all that, when they were done, they would just turn right back to their sin. And now God is good at a lot of things, but he is not good at sharing. He will not share his people with their sin. So repentance is changing your direction, but it is also changing your mind. And when I say changing your mind, I don't mean just being really sorry. I think you and I, we do that a lot. We feel bad for our sin. We hate ourselves and what we've done, but we don't turn or make any change. And so we just kind of stay this way in our sin, just feeling terrible. And now when you feel terrible, what do you often do? You do something that makes you feel good. What makes you feel good? Sin. But the sin makes you feel terrible. So you sin more and you feel worse, but if you feel worse, what do you do to make yourself feel good? Sin. And then you feel terrible once again, and so what do you do? You sin. You see the cycle that the enemy has so many of us in. Repentance is changing your direction as well as your mind. Charles Spurgeon uh, says it this way. I, I did some small edits just to make it easier to read. He says, repentance is a discovery of the evil of sin a mourning that we have committed it and a resolution to forsake it. It is in fact a change of mind of a very deep and practical character, which makes the man love the God he once hated and hate the sin he once loved. Repentance is not just going back to church. Repentance is not just feeling bad. It is totally changing your mind changing your mind about your sin, knowing that it is not profitable for you, and it's changing your mind about God. So on one hand, it's confessing and letting go, but a lot of times we only focus on that, what we lose. 
But what it is, is it's trusting God with a new way of life, a better way of life, a meaningful way of life. Repent is not a feelings word, it is an action word. And I'm not saying that your action or living differently, that's what saves you, but you know what? Our life changing and being transformed, that often proves that we're saved. It proves that the repentance that we're doing right now, it's real and it's genuine. Let me give you an example. Say you come back to church on a Sunday morning and you walk in and I see you and we do the shakas. You know what? My wife is pregnant. I'm not taking any risks, man. So I shaka you and you come into my bubble and I get scared and I like slap you in the face real hard. Like why and I slap, like close fist, whack, I just whack you. And I say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I repent, I feel super bad, I give you an ice pack. I'm like, hey, I love you so much. And, and, we, and we hug and everything's good. Well, we don't hug, but we pretend to hug and everything's good. And then you go and you come back the next week and I see you and I'm like, hey, I got a joke for you. And I'm like, what did the five fingers say to the face? And you say, what? And I go, slap, and I slap you again, okay? Now, at that point, many of you would probably crack me, which you should, but say you don't. And I'm, I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I slap you again the next week and the next week And the next week, every single time I see you, with no effort to change, every time I said sorry, would you believe that my repentance is genuine? No. Why? Because there was no change. Now, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. Actually, I'm saying the exact opposite. You and I are going to be practicing repentance until the day that we die. That's okay. It's it's a necessary process. This is actually the place in which God grows and he shapes us. Look at this powerful image Jesus gives us. This is in uh, John 15 verses one through three. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Okay, there's so much here, so just stay with me. He says you're already clean, which is true. That if you've put your faith in Christ, you've done that initial repentance, you are already saved. So there's an initial cleansing that happens, but then Jesus is saying that there's a cleansing that also comes after. That just because you're saved does not mean the pruning process is over. Actually, it means that the pruning process has just begun. You will and will always be a work in progress. And he says that. Look at what he says right here. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So even the life that does bear fruit, so a life that is glorifying God and growing in God and follows God, he still prunes that anyway. Why? Because there's stuff to be pruned. A word for prune in the Greek is kathairo, and it actually means to cut back, but it also means to purify and to clean. See, here's the thing. God must prune the old to make room for the new. God must prune the old to make room for the new because dead branches will never bear fruit. They'll never bear fruit. In fact, they will only take up space. They will rob you of branches that could grow fruit and so they must be cut off. In order for God to bring real growth in your life, there's some things that he just has to cut off And I think many times instead of letting him do that, you and I will just let the old and the new grow together. The dead and the new just grow together. And they exist because I think most times we don't even realize that it's there. Like think about a a, a bad attitude or like temper or like just like foul language. Many of us, we don't repent of it because we're just so used to it. The dead has grown with the new. I'm going to give you an example. I've used this one before, but, but I think a lot of people can relate to this. Say you wake up in the morning with a really bad attitude, which I'm sure has happened many times during quarantine, and you got to go and you got to run errands, or maybe you got to drive into work, and as you get in the car, you already know you got a stink attitude, so you're like, you know what, God, I'm just going to, I'm going to give it all to you today, 
And so we turn on like worship music or something and we're driving and you ever had that? Like you're in the middle of worshiping and like somebody cuts you off like right in that moment. Like it looks, it's happened to me. It kind of looks a little bit something like this. So you're driving and you're just like, good, good father. It's who you are. Are you stupid? Mary, Minerva, your eyes, eyes. Use your eyes. Go, go dummy, go, go. It's who you are putting on eyelashes, who you are, <laughs> like, we just like worship and then like curse at somebody and then just go back into worship. It's funny and relatable, but a perfect example of the dead and the new, the old and the new, just growing together. Your old way of thinking, your old way of acting, coexisting side by side in your life with Christ, cursing and praise out of the same mouth in the same sentence sometimes. And this happens when our life, we have bad days, obviously, but this happens more and more when our life lacks repentance. So let me ask you a very uncomfortable question that I asked myself this last week. When was the last time you repented? Like, think about that for a moment. When was the last time that you Repentant, like you, you said a prayer and you said, Lord, I am so sorry. I flew off the handle today. I yelled at my kids. I swore I blew up over nothing. When was the last time you have done that? Because I imagine you probably did some of those things in this quarantine season. I know that I am, I know I'm preaching to myself here, but I know I'm preaching to you too as well. Being quarantined with your family is rough. Because let's face it, they are super irritating. Not you, right? Like not us. Like everybody else is super irritating. We're good. But it's just like every single day. And so I know, I know there are some days that you wake up and your attitude smells like a porta potty on Taco Tuesday. You know what I mean? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? And I know because mine does too. There have been some days during quarantine that have been super hard. There have been some days where I've not been the best or most supportive husband. There have been days that I have not been the best father. So when was the last time that you confessed and you repented of your sin? It's probably been a while, but we sin daily. I honestly feel like most days we don't repent because we've just gotten used to our sin. The old and the new have grown alongside each other, the dead and the new alongside each other. And when our life lacks repentance, we unknowingly stay exactly the same. And there's fruit that God wants to bring forth, but he won't until he can cut some of these spaces off. John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 8, he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That as you keep, as you continue to do repentance, that it's actually going to produce and bring forth more fruit. There's a a shaping and a cleansing that the gardener only does in repentance. Because think about this, to confess or to call out a specific sin. Okay, like in prayer, like to say, Lord, I lost my temper is to say, Lord, my temper is a problem. Because a lot of times what we want to do is we want to say, it's not that bad. It's that person's fault. You know what? It's because of this and stress. But to say, Lord, and confess is to say, Lord, that is an actual problem in my life. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to prune me. To say, Lord, I'm so worried right now. I'm so full of doubt right now. Lord, when it comes down to it, I don't trust you. I'm sorry. It's to open that space of your life, that dead space to let God begin to work. To say, Lord, I got drunk. Lord, I looked at porn. Lord, I had sex outside of marriage. I I hate my brother or sister. I'm self-righteous. I feel better than others. I'm quick to be offended. I'm gossiping. My attitude sucks. I'm ashamed to share my faith. I'm racist. I'm tearing people down. I'm angry. I'm lashing out. To confess it is to call it out as sin. To confess it is to call it out as sin and to call it out as sin is to cry out to the gardener, help me, help me. I can't do this anymore. It's to reveal a part of yourself 
a dead part that maybe you've just been making excuses for for so long. And this is where he comes and this is where he begins to cut back. And he begins to prune us and purify us and it hurts. It hurts. It's hard to admit that, you know what, Lord, I don't have it all together. We'd rather just go into church and sing and just worship like everything's fine when it's not. So it hurts. It's hard, but it's necessary. This is where transformation happens. And the thing about the gardener's work in your life, it's never done. He's going to be working on you. As long as you're still breathing, he's going to be working on you. I don't care, you've been a Christian 50 years. There are some things that God wants to prune from your life today. His work is never done. And that might sound super depressing to some of you, uh, but I would actually argue that maybe you just don't have a clear picture of what spiritual growth actually is. I want to kind of show you like the journey that I had been on since I've been a Christian. Like I, I didn't really understand spiritual growth for a long portion of my life. And so when I first became a Christian, I thought spiritual growth is like this. Okay, so here's me at the bottom, there's Christ at the top, and I kind of just like get better and better and better until I eventually figure it out and this all becomes easy. Nope, wrong. Then I thought, okay, this has to be it. It's hills and it's valleys and I have good days and I have bad days and I have good weeks and I have bad weeks, but I get better and I get better and I better and I, and I hit my stride and then eventually I get really, you know, good at being a Christian. This is closer, but still a little bit off. It still all really depends on me. And so now here I am. I've grown up in church pretty much my whole life really been striving to follow Christ for about the past 15 years, been doing ministry for the last decade. And, and this is the conclusion that I have come to. This right here is spiritual growth. It's brutal. It's ugly. It's super messy. But would you look at this picture and would you see that his grace is found throughout? in the difficult places, in the broken places, in the shameful places, in the sin and the failure and the falling, that if you look at this chart and you try to find where are you on this, how you doing right now, would you know that wherever you are, would you look and see that his grace is right there with you? That's what makes it so beautiful. It's in the failure, it's in the repentance, it's in the struggle that we often find his grace the most. And so you and I, we have to understand this is very important because we're going to repent in a moment. That after you repent to Christ, you say, Lord, this is what's been going on. This is what I've been doing. At first, it should hurt. Like it, it hurts to admit that, you know what, I don't have it all together. And I'm struggling. It's, it's hard. But you know what? When you're done confessing, you should feel so good. Like the guilt, the shame, like all that shit, that's done. Like it's paid in full. So you should be able to, to actually feel and understand that you are free and feel and understand that you are forgiven. The only regret that you should have after repenting, the only regret that you should have is that you didn't repent sooner. And so let's do that together. The worship team is going to play this song. It really goes with everything we've been talking about. And during this song, if, if you haven't repented in a while, it's a good time to just sit. If you're alone, you can repent out loud. Sometimes you need to kind of hear what you're saying. You need to hear yourself call it out as sin. If you're with others, you can just repent in your heart. And then would you just meditate on the words being sung? Would you just worship along? And would you know that God is meeting you right here? So I'll come back out after and I will close this out. But before we do that, would you just spend some time with the Lord?
crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you into your careful hand and when I trust you I don't need to understand make me your vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing with all have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing. With all given me Jesus bring new wine out of me Jesus bring new The same Jesus in Matthew 4 that says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near is the same Jesus that calls you today. And a lot of times we think repent, it just means like I just gotta leave everything behind. And in a sense, that's what it is. But when he says the kingdom of heaven has come near, he's in essence saying, I have come near. I have come near to you. I have come close to you. And that's what he did. Jesus came to earth lived a sinless life, died for our sins so that we would not need to be bound by it anymore. So when he says repent, it's not just saying only leave everything behind. It's a beautiful invitation. You have so much more to gain than you do to lose. And there are some of you here that you feel God's prompting on your heart right now. Maybe for you, it just feels like a ton of guilt and a ton of shame Maybe there's tears. You know what? That's all good 
right in this space. But you know what? I want to give you an opportunity or a moment to just return back to Christ or maybe to put your faith in him for the very first time. So even if you're watching this and you're young or you're old, you've been a Christian for a while and fell away, or maybe you've never been a Christian, I want to walk you through this. And essentially, all we're going to do is pray together, and we're having you take that first step of putting your faith in Christ. Now, if you make that decision today, if you would click that little I have decided button, because you know what? We want to know who you are. We actually want to send you a free gift. Wherever you are in the world, we want to send you a free gift and just let you know this is a really big and amazing decision that you're making. And so would you bow your heads with me? If that's you and you've never put your faith in Christ before, or maybe you want to return, you want to put your faith back in him once again, Would you just repeat these words after me? And if you're with others, you can repeat them in your hearts and know that this is, these words don't save you, it's your faith in Christ. But let's solidify this moment together. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Come into my heart, come into my life, take complete control. Change me however you want. Be my Savior and my Lord. Let me pray for you as we close this out. Lord, I thank you for those that have made that decision here today. Lord, I pray that you would hold them, that you would keep them, that that picture of spiritual growth would be burned in their brain, that it's not always going to be easy, it's not always going to be fun. They are going to fail. But God, if they would lift their face, they would find that every single time you're right there with them. That they could walk a million miles, but the minute they turn around to repent, they find that their father is right there waiting for them. Hold them, Lord. Would you keep them? And would we walk with them, Lord, in this new amazing journey that they have just begun or begun once again? We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you made a decision for Jesus, we are so excited for you. Make sure that you click on the I Have Decided button on our website to take your next steps of faith. We want to walk with you on this new journey with the Lord. Whether you're tuning in from Hawaii or somewhere else around the world, we want to be part of this walk with you. So before you go, I have a few announcements. Uh, Remember that Growing Deep, Growing Strong starts this weekend. So if you call New Hope Leeward your church home, these classes are foundational to who we are as a church and what we believe. It is not too late to sign up for class. So Pastor Josiah and I are teaming up this weekend for 101, and we would love for you to join us via Zoom. You can register by emailing nextsteps at newhopeleeward.org. And seriously, sign up. It's not too late. And this month, we are spotlighting our women's ohana groups. We actually wanted to talk about our kingdom women ohana groups, to be exact. If you are a woman interested in developing a closer walk with Jesus and deep, authentic relationships with other women, join in and explore more about being a disciple and influencing others for Christ. For more information, email womens at newhopeleeward.org. So I'm going to go get ready for GDGS. Parents, don't forget about joining us on our kids page for the New Hope Kids lesson for this week. And if you have some time, join us for a weekend kids Zoom after the 4.30 Saturday service and 9 a.m. Sunday service. Be sure to stick around for our Digging Deeper questions and link up with your Ohana group this week to go even deeper into this weekend sermon. Keep following us on social media, download our app, and stay connected. We love you, and we will see you next weekend.